السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic raising righteous children is one which is not specific to women because the process of raising righteous children involve both the father and the mother. But as I'm addressing a female crowd, what I will speak about will be relative to yourselves. The first point that we need to consider that if we want righteous children, we ourselves as parents have to be righteous. We have to do what is required in order that righteousness can be nurtured and established. Righteousness as a norm doesn't come out of unrighteousness, but comes out of righteousness itself. So if we are considering raising righteous children as being something of major importance to us, then we have to consider where we started from because the righteous children are coming out of a couple, a husband and wife. So in choosing the husband for yourselves, in choosing the husband, righteousness is going to go back to your choice. So to, the, to a large degree, besides the woman herself striving to be righteous if she wants righteous children, she has to choose a spouse, a husband, who is likewise minded, one who wants to raise righteous children also, in the true sense, and not merely in the cultural sense, but in the true sense that the children, in the true sense that the children are morally grounded. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits. Morality, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu summarized his message what Allah sent him with as the last messenger to humankind. In a nutshell, morality. So that has to be foremost in our minds. Husband and wife have to be conscious of this Islamic focus. So, the Prophet ﷺ advised us that as women, men are married for four main reasons. Now, the hadith goes women, 
but I'm, because I'm talking to you, I mean, what's relevant to you here is that men, because though he said women, the same thing applies to men. Men and women, it's the same thing. So, as women, men are married for four main reasons. Their handsomeness, you know, women in choosing a husband will naturally seek to choose the most handsome male that they can find. Though the most handsome male may not help them raise righteous children. The handsome male who knows that he's handsome is proud, presumptuous, and may not be prepared to help in raising righteous children. However, if the handsomeness has not affected his character, there is no harm. The second focus is wealth. Marrying someone who has plenty of sustenance, he is able to provide all the necessary and superfluous aspects of a home, setting up a home. Also, women will try to choose someone who has respect in the society, has high status, etc. And last but not least, they may choose the male to be their husband based on his religiosity, how religious he is. And after outlining these four reasons, which are both for males and females, the Prophet ﷺ had said, take the one who is religious and you will be successful. Fadfar bidhat al-deen taribat yadak. So, that is a general picture which focuses on the importance of the religiosity of the husband and for the males, the religiosity of the wife as a starting point. Because raising righteous children, if you already have children, and you're just now thinking about raising righteous children, uh, the boat, you missed the boat. The boat has sailed and, you know, you weren't on it. So you have a big job ahead of you. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ also had said, if someone whose religion and character is good, and he asks for your daughter's hand in marriage, and you refuse him, there will be corruption in the land. If the refusal is based as it's commonly based on 
tribal reasons, because you don't belong to this tribe or that tribe or the other tribe. That is a formula for corruption. And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself left behind an example by himself in his own marriages, marrying a former Jewess in Medina, marrying an Egyptian, marrying from different tribes, even from the beginning. So, our concern should be that of religion if we want to raise righteous children. After having chosen the righteous husband, the Prophet ﷺ also taught us the dua Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibi shaytan ma razaqtana. O oh Allah, keep Satan away from us and keep him away from whatever children you have granted us or you will grant us. That is the dua which the Prophet ﷺ recommended for husbands and wives to make on their wedding night, on their coming together to produce the next generation. So that dua is essential. It should be learned, it should be known, and it should be utilized. Beyond that, the Prophet وسلم, taught us with regards to children and righteousness to Teach your children salah by the age of seven. Now this doesn't mean that at seven, that's the time when you need to teach them. You start it from earlier. They will imitate you. They'll want to pray beside you, encourage them. And the best salah outside of the prescribed salahs, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, is the prayer of a man and woman, a prayer in the home. Prayer at home, normally we consider prayer uh, in the masjid 25 times in jama'ah, 25 times superior to the prayer in the home. However, the Prophet ﷺ emphasized the importance of prayer in the home, saying that it's the best prayer after the obligatory prayers. Why? Because prayer in the home as a standard practice builds the foundation and the love of prayer among the children that are raised in that home. I should mention, of course, that the Prophet ﷺ had said also, spank them by the age of 10 if they're not praying consistently to spank them, that, of course, this hadith is there, and 
we should respect it, but only to keep in mind that the intention of the spanking is only to catch their attention, wake them up, rather than physical harm, where you end up brutalizing and abusing the children. The next point in terms of raising righteous children is one which involves education of the parents. Education in the sense that today we have access to information regarding human social uh, interactions and how uh, people develop in different contexts, etc. Psychologists have analyzed, child psychologists have analyzed the various phases that children go through. It is necessary for parents, mothers, and fathers to be aware of these. Not necessarily that they go and get degrees in psychology, of course they can. They're encouraged. And the International Open University offers bachelors in Islamic psychology, masters in Islamic psychology, and PhDs in Islamic psychology. It is a very important field. However, at least understanding the various stages that children go through is important in raising the children righteously. For example, there is a stage which is called the terrible twos. Huh? Those, those of you who already have children grown up, I'm sure you remember those days. The terrible twos are, you know, memorable days where children seem to flip right around the age of two. You know, they flip and become resistant to anything that you try to tell them to do. No, their response. They refuse to do what you tell them to do. Now, people who don't understand that this is a natural phase that the vast majority of children go through. It lasts for a year or two, some maybe longer, and they pass on. So in many of our countries, Muslim countries, where parents are ignorant of this phase, and they see the child flip, they automatically conclude they have been possessed by a jinn. You know, they, they want to take the child to the sheikh, you know, have the sheikh read over them and all, all of this. Because they, they didn't know that this is what all children or most children do. So the knowledge of the nature of the child is going to be very helpful in raising the children. Um, otherwise, the other negative consequence becomes one of harming the children in order to break their resistance, their unwillingness to do what we tell them to do. Then we apply pressure on them and that can affect their character in the long run. They will carry things from the early age into their later years of life. So much so that 
a few years back in Canada, one of the sisters who was from Pakistan, living there in Montreal, beat her child to death because he wasn't learning the surahs which the sheikh had given them. You know, beat the child to death. So, seeking knowledge is obligatory on us to be able to pass that knowledge on to our children as well as to guide our own actions in dealing with them. And there are other phases. I mean, it's, it's, there are well-known phases which have been established and identified. The phase of imitation, where the child tries to imitate the father or imitate the mother. And that, that's another phase which goes on for a few years. And so on and so forth. So, the next most important area for raising righteous, righteous children is that of choosing your friends and their friends well. The Prophet ﷺ had stressed the importance of choosing righteous friends because we will be raised on the Day of Judgment with our friends. So, as parents, on our level, we have to choose righteous uh, individuals, families, to spend the greater portion of our time around. It doesn't mean that we ignore or break ties with other family members who are not necessarily up to the higher levels of righteousness in terms of their behavior and character. Because Prophet Muhammad had told us, La yadkhulul jannatak qatta One who breaks ties with family will not enter paradise. So, we try to find the balance between the two. Establishing that relationship with good, righteous friends, whether it's our relatives, or neighbors, or workmates, or whatever capacity we have developed friendships, we should be keeping righteousness in the forefront in the same way that we kept righteousness in the forefront in choosing a husband in the first place. So, if those friends are ones whom you wouldn't like to be raised on the Day of Judgment with, then you need to distance yourself from them, not break ties, but reduce the time spent with them, try to find others who remind you of Allah and whose children would play in a way that is uh, beneficial for developing Muslim, righteous Muslim character. The seventh point that I came up with <coughs> was schooling. Schooling, raising righteous children. A good portion of their early life is spent in school. So, we have to say, as my brother reminded you, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْعُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِي Each and every one of you is like a shepherd responsible for his or her flock. You are a shepherd and you will be مَسْعُولٌ You will be asked about your children. 
So when you choose the school for your child, it should be an Islamic school. As much as it's humanly possible, you should put them in an Islamic school. That is the right of the child. It's the right of the child that he or she is educated in an Islamic environment because that's going to help them grow in righteousness and Islamic consciousness. So you need to find a suitable Islamic or Islamized school or you need to be about trying to set one up. On the primary and secondary level, those who set up schools, run schools, etc., tend to be females. And that's fine. Because the concern regarding the children should be the greatest amongst you, spending most of the time with the children. So it is important that from amongst you would be those, a group, who would establish Islamic uh, or Islamized schools for children to study in here. If it was an Islamic country, then it would be the responsibility goes to the government, etc., officials to provide that for the population. But as we are in a country which is not specifically Islamic, it's uh, neutral, we have to find ways and means to provide correct schooling for our children. And this becomes so critical when we consider that the majority of the time spent in school, uh, in a day spent in school, this is what's going to influence the children the most. They will spend more time in school than they will spend, spend with you as a mother or father. So, it being the most uh, critical area in the seven upwards level, it becomes critical for us to provide proper schooling for our children. Following the schooling, or along with the schooling, we should build in the children a sense of haya or modesty. We are living in a time where modesty is looked down upon globally. Women and men who want to cover their aura, etc., in modest ways, are looked down upon. And the music industry and other industries promote uh, nakedness. I remember even visiting Muslim schools in different parts of the world where the image which is used to teach the body parts for kids in the early grades, they will have a little boy in his underwear and a sign pointing to his hand saying hand, head, feet, etc. So I would tell them, time and time again, I would go to different schools and tell them, listen, 
you have an art department. Let the art department put some clothing on the boy, you know, which covers the aura. It's simple. Put some clothing on the boy, which covers the aura, and you still can work with hand and foot and head and all these different things. But the consciousness oftentimes is not there. That's what they provide in the stores, you know, that special uh, chart which shows the body parts, and it's inappropriate for a Muslim school. So, that modesty, when non-Muslims, of course, look at it, it's oppression. If we put our little girls uh, wearing longer dresses, and if they wear a little hijab on their head, whatever, you know, they see us as oppressing our children, etc. But the key is, if we don't get the children accustomed to modest dressing, that is not tight-fitting clothes for males and females, skin tight, that's become the norm now, you know, it's, it's that, that type of dress is nakedness. It's nakedness. So, if we don't get them used to it, in growing up, it means now when the time comes, when they reach puberty, now you have a fight on your hands. Because the, the girls are used to wearing skin tight clothes and the boys likewise, and now you're telling them, no, you need this to be loose, you know, not exposing your aura. They've been, they've been raised with the new generation of lewdness. So it's very difficult to turn that around once it has become an established norm. So we have that responsibility in the home to develop that sense of shyness. It's natural and it should be nurtured. And the Prophet ﷺ praised shyness when he came across one of the companions uh, chastising his brother because of his shyness which prevented him from doing some things, and the Prophet ﷺ told him, don't. You know, he is blessed with that shyness. So, it's very important for us to develop modesty in our children and to maintain, maintain modesty amongst them when we are amongst them. The ninth principle has to do with social media. Social media today has become dominating. The easy way when the children are stopping us from doing what we want to do is give them a phone or give them an iPad, give them something which will keep them busy. And it might work in the sense that you're now free to do what you need to do, but at the same time, we're damaging the kids. Damaging them in ways that may be very difficult to undo later on. So, we don't want to end up with a situation where everybody has a phone, everybody is busy with his or her phone, you know, the family may be in a gathering together, but everybody is separate in their own apps or whatever, and the family bonds are being broken. Social media is challenging 
the bonds that hold the families together. So, <clears throat> very important to keep this under control. Some families decide to remove it altogether. We will have no phones. Just the old analog phones which don't have images and all these other kind of things. You can't play games on them, etc. They just go with that. You know, I say, mashallah, you know, that's, that's a good choice. I won't say everybody should do it that way because different circumstances may require uh, different solutions. <clears throat> but controlling social media is critical. It's attacking the very foundations of the family. The tenth point to keep in mind as we are raising the family is to be able to distinguish between cultural Islam and Islamic culture. It sounds like the same thing. Culture, Islam, Islam, culture. No, cultural Islam is the Islam practiced according to tradition. What you found in your family, what you grew up with, what your parents did, what your grandparents do, your uncles, aunts, everybody around you is doing these things. And we assume that this is Islam. However, in many cases, it's not Islam. It's against Islam. It's against the teachings of Islam, etc. Islamic culture is the culture which comes out of practicing Islam properly. That's the difference. So, very important to establish the Islamic culture on an educational level, on a social level, on all the levels that we function. Distinguish between the two because this is a struggle, an ongoing struggle. And shaitan is busy utilizing the circumstances which produce the, these struggles. So, I just mention one anecdote uh, from my own family. In Riyadh, when my son, who had been going to Quranic school, etc., <clears throat> uh, in an Islamic school, in the Arabic section, it had an Arabic and an English section of the school. He came home and complained to me that his classmates, some of his classmates, were praying without wudu. They were praying without wudu. So I tried to get a feel of what he was talking about, the circumstance. It, it turns out that, you know, the um, administration is very strict about the salah, get in there, make the salah, etc. You know. But the necessary time and follow up in terms of preparation for salah, they ignored. But the kids all know wudu, they know the conditions of the acceptability of salah, what breaks salah, etc., etc. They had all these things memorized. The rules, if you ask them what are the conditions, they tell you that, 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 that. But yet they were running in the masjid praying without wudu. So, very important that the essential element of the prayer is taught to them.
Like the kids, for example, are taught the five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman, etc. So they've memorized them. They can give you the list exactly as the list is given. But the moral principles that are behind each of the five pillars of Islam and six pillars of Iman, they have no idea. And many adults, till today, they have no idea what are the moral principles because for sure, when the Prophet ﷺ said that he was only sent to perfect the highest of moral character, when he, was, when he expressed that, it meant that this should be at the core of everything in Islam. Morality. Um, among the challenges for raising children righteously is the current situation where both parents are working. Both parents are working. In order to have a uh, comfortable life, etc., both parents are in the workforce, and again, the end result will be that children end up becoming neglected. Not enough time spent with those children. We have to question ourselves when both husband and wife are out working. If we're not able to provide the basic necessities, etc., uh, through the husband, it's understandable that the wife also works to try to establish those basic necessities. But if the necessities are provided and the wife is going into the workforce uh, out of a desire to feel more fulfilled, you know, as a working mother, professional, etc., has a certain status in the society or whatever, we have to question ourselves and ask, is this really necessary? Is this the best way forward? Or shall we uh, forego some of the uh, pleasantries of life for the sake of our children? The last point is the challenge that we are faced with in the society as a result of the high divorce rate. This is something inherited in the past. In the past, of course, divorce was uncommon but today not getting divorced is uncommon so with the father figure out of the equation it becomes a necessity for the females to try to replace that father figure uh, either by remarrying or by making sure that father figures are there in the home for both members of our both groups of our children males and females because that is also very important for their own psychological development and uh, would be important for us to establish the moral example that the children need in the early stages of their development. <clears throat> so that concludes 
points that I was able to gather and I hope that they are useful, you can find some benefit in it and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the tawfiq, the blessing of being able to raise righteous children who will pray for you after you have passed rather than curse you in the grave. Barakallah fikum.